Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, if you'll follow along as, we, as I read this morning. It says this, as one day he was teaching and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him, in front of Jesus. But not finding a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? They were right. But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins have been forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. Immediately he got up from them, picked up what he had been laying on, and went home glorifying God. They were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its purity. Uh, we thank you for its inerrancy. We thank you how it can teach our hearts each and every time we read it and study it and hear it preached. Father God, may, it, may you write your word on our hearts today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In our cultural, culture today, there, over the last 20 years, there has become this obsession with extremes. All sorts of extremes. Uh, a friend of mine were talking about it one time. You know, used to, we used to get a 12-ounce drink. Or if you go back far enough, you got a six-and-a-half-ounce drink. And that was plenty, right? Yeah, it was plenty. And then you had to have 12, and then you had to have 16. And now you go in, the best you can do is a 20. <laughs> Might be a 24-ounce. It's just getting bigger and bigger. We have this, our culture likes things bigger and better. We have extreme sports where people jump over cars and jump up and down on things with motorcycles. Uh, they do the high jump with a motorcycle. Uh, I don't think the high jump was ever meant to be done with a motorcycle, but they do it. There's all kinds of extreme sports out there. Um, you, see, you see on TV, you see extreme makeovers, whether it be for the face or the whole body or for the home or for the kitchen or for the bath, but extreme makeovers. Might even be for your yard. I ran across something very interesting that I did not know existed. And it's called extreme ironing. You heard me, ironing, like you're ironing your clothes. It's called extreme ironing. And, the, and the, the point of this is to take extreme activities and add ironing to it. Well, I'm telling you, I pick my clothes, I go to the store and buy my clothes, I look for stuff that don't have to be ironed, okay? I mean, I don't want to iron it, even if it's in the comfort of air conditioning, okay? I, I, I don't want to iron my clothes. Uh, if I'm wrinkled, you're just going to have to live with it because I don't like to iron clothes, okay? But it, there's an extreme ironing. You've got these people that literally go up and hang upside down on cliffs and with battery-operated irons, iron. They've got people that have done it in trees. Uh, they, I saw one picture of this guy ironing his clothes on the back of a cow. Extreme ironing. Uh, like I said, I don't like ironing, much less do I want to do it while hanging from ropes. But as we look at our passage today, I, I tell you about extremes. Because what we're going to see here is something very extreme. It's going to be what I call extreme faith or extreme Christianity. We're going to walk through this story. It's a familiar story to most of us. Uh, we, we know what happens in the story. Uh, we've, we've, we were taught this story. as a ch If you grew up in church, you were taught this story as a child growing up. We've heard the story of the man that was lowered through the roof. 
to get in front of Jesus. But I want us to walk through this story. I'm going to take the time just to point out a few extremes as we walk through it. But the first thing I want us to see is what I call extreme friends. Extreme friends. Now let's, let's kind of set the stage a little bit. Think about what was going on and, and think about what happened here. It says that these friends, and I'm going to call them the four friends because four corners of a pallet, they would be carrying their friend on. But these four friends, uh, they, they heard, it says there, they heard of Jesus' ministry. And they heard about what Jesus had been doing. I'm sure the message had spread from, from town to town uh, about the miracles that Jesus had been performing. About the great things that he was doing. And the friends said, you know what? We need to get our friend in front of Jesus. We need to get our friend to Jesus. And so they heard the news in town that Jesus was down the road. He was at this home and he was teaching and he was preaching. And it says here that the power of healing was with him. And he was healing people and, and great things were going on. And so they grabbed their friend and they head that way. We're talking about a friend that can't move. We're talking about a friend that's, that's paralyzed. Uh, we're talking about a friend that can't do anything for himself. We're talking about a friend that could not get himself there even if you told him about the event. So these four friends, they pick him up. And we're not told how far they carried him. But, you know, if you're carrying dead weight, how far can you carry that dead weight without having to shift, without having to change arms, without having to stop and rest? Not that far. Not that far at all. You're going to stop. You're going you're gonna to come to that point, hey, guys, rotate, <laughs> or whatever the case may be. Hey, guys, let's rest just for a minute. But, and, and they probably did that. They probably stopped. They probably rotated. They probably changed arms. They probably, some took the lead and some were behind. And they probably changed positions and they rested along the way. But they didn't stop. They saw and believed it to be important to get their friend in front of Jesus. So they had taken this journey, however long it was, this journey to get to this home where Jesus was at. And the crowd was so thick. The crowd was, uh, there were so many people. There was so much going on. There were so many people wanting to get that glimpse, to get that touch, to be able to see Jesus and what he, and hear Jesus, what he was saying and see what he was doing. They said, we'll never get all the way through there with this, with this pallet. We'll never get all the way through here carrying him. I can only imagine one of them said, look, there's some stairs to the roof. Let's go up there and let him down. So they take their friend, who they've already carried for, for, for a certain distance, and they say, you know, let's go up these stairs. This wouldn't have been an easy flight of stairs. It wouldn't have been a gradual climb. This would have been, if they had access to the roof, it would have been something they would have used on occasion just for going up and sitting. They, they, so there probably was access. Has anybody ever tried to carry dead weight upstairs? It's not easy. It's difficult. The people that are on the bottom carry the brunt of the weight. So they probably had to reposition. Said, all right, you're bigger. You're, you two the biggest. You're on the back. And so they, and, and, but they moved him up there. But then they got up there, and, and it's not like tearing through shingles and, and tar paper and roof decking and <laughs> all that like we know today. It was probably a thatched roof where they let him down. But they tore the roof apart. Didn't own the home. May or may not have known the people. But they said it's so important that we get our friend in front of Jesus, we're going to take this roof apart and lower him down. There was no obstacle too big stop these people, these four men, I'm going to call them, from getting their friend in front of Jesus. Those are extreme friends. But are we willing to ask ourselves the same question? Are we 
willing to put ourselves under the same test? Are we willing to, to, to place ourselves under the same spotlight and ask this question? How far am I willing to go to get my friends in front of Jesus? What extremes will I go to to get my friends in front of Jesus? What lengths will I take to get my friends in front of Jesus? Will I be an extreme friend for a friend in need? It's a great story, but it's about extremes. And these are extreme friends. What obstacles do we have to overcome? What obstacles do we have to face? What obstacles are we, uh, do we struggle with when we think about getting our friends in front of Jesus? What are the things that we focus on the most? What are the things that bring us the most fear? What are the things that cause us to stumble the most? Well, you know, we like, here's one we like to use when we think about getting our friends in front of Jesus. Well, you know, the timing just wasn't right. Anybody ever thought that, said that? Sure we have. Has anybody had that opportunity and thought, well, you know, it was, the, it was just kind of awkward. Just, I, it just, I just didn't know what to say. I didn't really know what to do. It was the, the, the situation was just sort of awkward. Or we might have, say, simply just say, you know, the, the subject never came up. You know, I, I don't want to offend anybody. I, I, I don't want to put them off. I don't want to push them away. Well, they're already away from Jesus. They're already, they're already there. Where, where are you going to push them? What are we willing to do? What obstacles, small obstacles compared to these men, what obstacles are we willing to overcome? What extremes are we willing to go to to be extreme friends? To get our friends in front of Jesus. So we've got extreme friends, but I want to talk about the second thing, another extreme that we see here. And that is extreme faith. Extreme faith. If you'll notice there in, in verse 20, the Bible says, seeing their faith. Seeing their faith huh that's pretty good that's extreme faith if you ask me if somebody says i see your faith then that means i'm living it out that means i'm willing to go to extremes that means i'm willing to do things the reason jesus said i see your faith is because these men that carried their friend through town and up this up onto this roof and dug this roof out and opened this roof up and lowered their friend down their, their faith, their belief was, if I can get my friend in front of Jesus, he'll make a difference. He'll change my friend. They had the faith that that was going to happen. And Jesus said, seeing their faith. Do people see our faith? Do people see our actions? The Gospel of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, simply said that uh, people will see your good works and they will point them, uh, them to the Father in heaven. Are people seeing how we live our lives? Are people seeing what we say? Are people seeing what they do? And when they do see what we say and when they do see what we do, do they see our faith? Extreme faith. Jesus said seeing their faith. Do you think they would have went to such extremes if they didn't believe it would make a difference? No. If I didn't believe it would have made a difference, if I didn't believe Jesus would have made a difference in my friend's life, would I have hauled him up on a roof and lowered him through it? Would you? It's okay to say no. I wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm a pretty good friend of mine, you know. But I'm not just going to tote them up on a roof and lower them into somebody's house. I don't know. If I don't believe, it's going to make a difference. It's an extreme faith. Faith simply 
and this is not new, but this has been used many times through the years. But forsaking all, I trust him. F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I trust him. I trust God. I trust Jesus. That's what he was saying. That's what he saw. That's what Jesus says when I was seeing their faith. He saw a forsaking all. I trust him. Forsaking all, I trust that Jesus is going to make a difference in my friend's life. So they had extreme, extreme faith. Will we be marked? Will we be known for extreme faith? Will we be that extreme friend? Will people see our extreme faith? But the third extreme I want you to see in this passage of Scripture, and I really think this is the most important, and that is this. This passage of Scripture teaches us about extreme forgiveness. Extreme forgiveness. You read there, And Jesus said, he said, your sins are forgiven in verse 20. And then after being questioned, uh, he said to the Pharisees, he says, which is easier to say in verse 23, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk. But you know, I, I threw it in there when I was reading it through in the Pharisees and said, who but God alone can forgive sins? They were right. They were absolutely right. They just didn't realize that God was in their midst. They just didn't realize that God was, it was there in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. They didn't realize that the Messiah stood with them. The Son of God. But they were right. They were dead on. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Let me tell you, God's forgiveness is extreme. God's forgiveness is enormous. The word forgive, or as we talk about forgiveness, it, it simply means, you know, to pardon of guilt. It means to, uh, it means that things won't be held against us. It means that we have a clean slate when God forgives us of our sins. Scripture tells us that God will separate us from our sin as far as the east is from the west. And I, I, and I love this word picture. It's one of my favorites. And here's why. It's so visual, and I'm a visual learner. If I take out from here, and I head east, think about it, think about the globe. If I take off east, I will always be going east. Okay? If I take off west, I will always be going west. Okay? Now, we got that picture. All right, now, head north. You head north on the globe. When you get to the North Pole, you start going south. And you continue going south till you get to the South Pole, and then you start going north again. North and south meet. Okay? East and West never meet. They never come together. And so when God says, I will separate your sins from you as far as the East is from the West, He means I will forgive you, I will wipe your slate clean, I will make you clean, I will make you whole, I'll make you pure enough to enter the gates of heaven where there is no sin. That's extreme forgiveness far as the east is from the west psalms 130 verses 3 and 4 says this says if you O lord should mark iniquities O lord who could stand but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared that you may be revered we could never stand before a holy god in our own right we can never stand before a holy God and say, no, I think I've been good enough. I don't think we can stand, we can't stand before a holy God and say, you know, I think my, 
my goods outweighed my bads. <laughs> you know, I think I'm doing pretty good. How about a pat on the back? I do little quirky things, and I'm going to show you one of those. I got curious one time, and I st got my calculator out and started multiplying sins. Everybody ever done that? It doesn't sound like fun, does it? Uh, but he here's, here, I'm going to share a little bit with you. I asked this question. Who in here today would say they only sin five times a day in thought, attitude, and deed? Okay, good. We don't have any self-righteous. <laughs> Let me ask you this. How about ten? I'm going to stop there. But if you take, all right, we're talking about, we're in church, okay? We're talking about the good folks. I mean, the folks that are trying to walk with the Lord, trying to live for Him, trying to be obedient. And we're still saying, man, we're, I'm still coming in at 10 plus. And if you do the, do the math, at age 70, okay, at age 70, we would have the audacity to stand before a holy God and say, God, I've only got a quarter million sins on my account. I think I've done pretty good. No. God's forgiveness is extreme because of whether it's a quarter of a million or a half a million or a million or two million or three million, if we experience the forgiveness of God, we stand before a holy God and he says, welcome. Because his forgiveness and his holiness and his righteousness that he gives us makes us worthy to go to heaven. Not anything I can say or do. That is what I call extreme forgiveness. Extreme. I haven't met a soul in my years of ministry. I've never met one person that had experienced the forgiveness of God that said, you know, <laughs> wish that hadn't happened. <laughs> it doesn't, that person doesn't exist. If you have experienced the forgiveness of God, if you have experienced the saving grace of God, and you're a child of God, I'm telling you, you don't, you don't ever get over that. You don't ever reach a point where, ah, I wish I hadn't done that. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 11, the Bible says, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is the Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. And whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now then, will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher, without a proclaimer? without somebody to tell them. I'm telling you right now, we allow obstacles in our lives to keep us from being that extreme friend, to keep us from being and showing that extreme faith so that people we love and we know can experience the extreme forgiveness of God. I can't predict, I can't guarantee, I can't uh, write you a contract on how any one person will respond to the gospel of Christ. But I can tell you right now, if the gospel of Christ is not proclaimed to that person, 
they'll never experience the extreme forgiveness God holds out to them. Are we willing to be extreme friends? Are we willing to live out that extreme faith so that others can experience God's extreme forgiveness? The invitation is simple today. Simply this. Maybe you're here today and you've never experienced that extreme forgiveness. Maybe you've never experienced what it means to be made clean, to be made whole, to be made right with God. Maybe you don't know what that means. You never experienced that. So I invite you today, if you have never experienced his extreme forgiveness, let today be that. Because I promise you, it's been proclaimed to you today. The invitation may be this. Maybe you need to come and you need to pray and you need to say, God, help me be an extreme friend. Help me to be, help me to be bold. Help me to be the person that I need to be. Help me to proclaim what I need to proclaim when the opportunities arise. Maybe that's where you need to be. Come to the altar and pray for that. Or maybe you want to come to the altar today and you want to simply get on your face before God and say this. God, my friend, you fill in the blank, needs to know Jesus. God, help me to be that extreme friend. God, help me. I just pray that you put somebody in their life. Maybe they're not in this community. Maybe they're somewhere else. Maybe they live in another state, another town, and whatever. God, put somebody in their life. God, put somebody in their path. But somebody that they'll listen to that'll tell them about your extreme forgiveness. Whatever the case is, be obedient to God in this time of invitation. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for its forthrightness. I thank you for, Lord, how it gets to the point. I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. God, help us all to be extreme friends to those around us. Help us to live out an extreme faith in front of them, Father God, that they'd be drawn to this extreme forgiveness that we have experienced as your children. I pray now, God, there's one here, two here, three here, Lord God, Lord, have never experienced your forgiveness. Father God, they would, they would come today and would be their day of salvation. I pray, Father Lord, Lord, that we would all be prayerful, that we would be bold, and that we would be uh, willing, that we would be obedient when those times come that we need to, uh, to get people in front of Jesus. Father, may this time of invitation, may this altar call, uh, may it, Lord, be at a time that brings you glory, brings you honor. And we pray it all in Jesus' name.